That was tolerable, I hope, as a test. So uh, then let's continue more or less where we picked up yesterday. Uh, we were yesterday finishing by, ex by explaining to ourselves that indeed you would be much wiser to not only have a cost correlator but also have a sign correlator and thereby you would basically be at full sensitivity regardless of the whereabouts of a point source in the field. And that way we, you would be able to find both the amplitude of such a source and you would find its location step and fringes. You would not know at which fringe it would be sitting, but you would lo know where the fringe would be sitting that fits on that source. So you have a, a location indicator in there, that's the face of such a signal. By the way, I also promised you to provide you with a bit more reference documentation, in particular very excellent websites, and I can recommend basically all of these to you. That's why I put them on the handout, so you have now a, your own way of finding your way at these other summer school uh, documentations that are very good for all this stuff that you that we are doing here. So we yesterday decided that you need more than one correlator because a cost correlator only has zero, respon zero responsivity on the sky at all these stripes in between where he has got enough responsivity. And that is a pity because as I'm looking at the sky, I would much rather have a full sensitivity for all point sources, for all elementary emitting element on the sky that you can find. In the so, the proper trick is then, you can find out, is if I now instead have a correlator which looks at the quadrature of this signal, and the quadrature is properly defined because we have already defined the quasi-monochromatic radiation, so basically quadrature is a quarter wavelength away, the wavelength is now a defined thing. Then we can, by correlating both a signal directly and doing that also in quadrature, we can have two numbers coming out, which both together can define the amplitude and the phase. And so a cost correlator all by itself is not good enough. The odd part of that emission is seen by the sin correlator. Mind you, we have decided this on the basis of a very very superficial, a very stylistic model. We have decided that we have two receiving elements. And we bring the signals from there together to correlate here at exactly equal path length. As we were discussing before in optics, that that is difficult for optics to make and sometimes therefore you don't get a good image. It is a reality of course not so that all these cables and receivers and all the electronics on the way is equally long on both ends, for sure, and sufficiently precisely. And therefore, whether we're talking about a cost correlator or a sign correlator is not particularly well defined. A single correlator, which does one wire in, the other wire in, and then you correlate, and out comes the signal, that is the one that we now consider the cost correlator. But if accidentally there is already a, a bit of a phase shift in one of these cables as compared to the other, just because it is a bit longer. It might be the sign correlator, it might be anything else. But the only thing we really absolutely do need, precisely, is another correlator, which is a quadrature. It doesn't really matter which one is the cross correlator or the sign correlator, or, putting it differently, we'll see this picture, uh, that one again, this is the device with, that we need. I'm not so sure that not in here or in here, there is already something that does this a few more times. 
and in fact not quite pi over 2 but some arbitrary number in the wires, wiring leading up to here. So the thing is not that I turn a cross correlator into a sine correlator, I'm turning a correlation this way into the quadrature correlator which I also need. That's the, only, the real point. The definition of who is cos and who is sine is not so well defined. Here it looks like the sine correlator because of this pi over 2 in one and the other one we straight. But the straightness is not so well defined. That's the point I'm trying to make. So it's basically only the fact that you need two orthogonal directions in your correlators. That is the part, uh, the, the fact that matters. And the interesting part, in reality, of course, sooner or later, is this delay part. Because that is the relevant thing for the phase. If the source sits not quite at S, but is slightly more in, in that direction, then that delay from that source is slightly longer than the nominal one. And that we can see as a phase flaw. So the definition of phase is a geometric one. And we will see that in order to get proper phases out later on, We've got to do all sorts of precise things about the total path length all through your electronics, all into your element that receive it, and also in the color correlator itself. But it stays such a way that you do absolutely need the quadrature signal in order to make sure that you have a uniform sensitivity in the whole field that you're looking at. That then turns us up with a complex visibility, which is the output of what we call the cost correlator and the sine correlator. But it's this two quadrature linked correlators that together make, with a standard way, make for an amplitude and a phase, which is just the arctan of the two signals. So if you measure a signal which is 17, com, uh, comma 3 coming out of the correlator, the two correlators. Then you have a complex vis uh, visibility which has 17 in one and 3 in the other. And so if I call the one phase 0 if it sits in there, or 2 pi or 4 pi or 6 pi or 8 pi, then I can find the phase this way, and the amplitude this way, and this 17,3 actually means something. It means there is a source sitting there which has an amplitude of square root of 17 squared plus 3 squared, about 18, and it has a phase of about 30 degrees, 20 some degrees. You can see that from this number. So that number is interpretable in pure reality. I know also where these fringes are because that's defined by my maze line. So I have now observed something about that source. Now that is not particularly telling with a single interferometer on a single reading, because a single Fourier component is not so telling about the source. Yet I do have an amplitude already, and I sort of know that it's sitting somewhere on that, or that, or that, or that, or that fringe. So I do have, not certain, but with a high precision, either here, or there, or there, or there, position of that thing, as well. So a signal in the front of the reading is in fact quite interpretable already, in terms of the true physics you're looking at. That's rather different from the image that you might want to have, because you like pictures much better. But reality, sometimes, if you're very short of uh, telescope time, or you must integrate awfully long before you have any signal, then you might be content with only 25 different readings, which tell you most of what you would want to do. So I have uncertainty in that direction. I have uncertainty whether it's this one or that one or that one. So I would make another measurement, which has lower periodicity that I could choose between this one and that one, because it's this one if it's sitting here, and then it's not so much on the next one. 
So I take different baseline readings at different position angles, and very soon I get sort of what I want. If I want positions of radio sources, I need only a few different positions on the, in the position angle, and I can get very precise positions to a fraction of a, of a fringe. I want you to be very uh, familiar with all these notations, and then I want you to realize what you're looking at. It can be completely seen as two equilibrium defined sensitivity patterns. If I look at this pattern, this this one correlator is, for instance, maximally sensitive just at the middle of this Gaussian source, that would mean that a quarter wave further to one side, the other one, the quarter correlator, is most sensitive to that same source. And so together, these two sensitivities make up for a uniform sensitivity across the source. And that, you can see, allows you to sum pictures uh, together from a few different readings. You can also see how the readings are defined by the, the intensity on the sky from different periodicities that you will then have to sample with your baseline. Baseline here defined as you always, for this purpose, a wavelength. Based, so the unit length for measuring baseline length, in this sense, is always the wavelength. And seeing that, it tells you straight away you have a problem because you have not one wavelength. So if I want to talk about an awfully long baseline, which wavelength do I mean? And that, of course, is your central wavelength of the passband. And therefore, you have a mix of wavelength in there. And if you're not careful, that actually causes loss of signal. So you must make sure that you stay within the proper envelope. And we'll come back to that. You can also see that I have sources which are sufficiently broad on the sky to be resolved. That that gives a sensitive uh, response envelope because of these high periods wiggles, which, as you might imagine, look rather much like a sink, because it's a block function. If I bring them closer together, then the period between them goes lower, but the envelope stays put still. And if I make them more peaked, then that means that the envelope is bigger, because the sources themselves are narrower. Again, it's a standard point that you should realize all the time, smaller in one domain makes bigger in the other, and the other way around. And that's exactly why we can, with a baseline, that we can make relatively large just by cables and moving the telescopes around, or putting them very far apart, allows us to have very narrow beams on the sky so that we can have high resolution and high precision. It's important to realize, and we've brought it up a few times more already, that you cannot bring these two elementary collectors together so as to fall on top of one another. And so you do not have the reading for zero baseline, which has a uniform sensitivity in the Fourier domain, as you We have decided that the delta function has a uniform sensitivity, gives a uniform response. That one you can only collect from a single dish. However, the single dish has another problem. It is extremely sensitive to all the things that you don't want to be sensitive to, like the TV broadcast next door, or the, or the cars, or what traffic, and, or lightning. Or, there's all sorts of things that come in there as well. So it's extremely difficult to calibrate that. A very nice effect of interferometry is that the correlation of this signal and that signal 
usually talks only about this signal and that signal. If I put another signal in here, because someone is parking his motorbike right next to the telescope, that signal, even if it makes it to the other thing, is so far delayed that it is not coherent anymore and it does not come out of the correlation coefficient. Unless the, the receiver goes non-linear because it has too much signal here, but as long as the receiver is completely nice and linear, but it sees it, then that signal does not come out in a correlated sense the other way. You can see that mathematically the visibility is Hermitian in the sense that, that or meaning that the, uh, the opposed, opposite number, the visibility for negative baselines, the baseline the other way around, is its complex conjugate, and that you might call mathematics. However, it's basically just physics. It says that the sources on the sky are are physically real, that we are observing something that's real, and therefore its Fourier transform is, of course, emitting. That's the only statement. Yes, we were looking at this phase slope yesterday at the end of the afternoon. What you're doing with a log baseline interferometer is you're putting basically a phase slope across and the phase slope across is putting, is sense, makes sense as long as I think in terms of complex visibilities. I'm equally sensitive to amplitude all over the place, but the phase that I see is rotating and rotating the further away I run from the center. And that looks like fringes if I look at a single correlator. It looks like only a rotating phase, a running phase like this in the arc 10 of the two numbers. And so the steeper this slope is, the longer my baseline is, that's the same thing, the higher the resolution on the sky, because the resolution that we have on the sky is, the whole fringe is 2 pi long. Because then I have done a full wavelength and I go back to the original situation. So it's the whole detection situation is periodic, in the direction orthogonal to the baseline. It's periodic, and the period is set by what causes 2 pi here. So, we have decided that this visibility that we can measure is just a Fourier component of the image that we would possibly like to have. And so, any interferometer can make these measurements at a specific set of coordinates, which are the Fourier coordinates of that brightness distribution in the sky. And so we need sufficient knowledge of the visibility function to get a reasonable best estimate. The real issue, of course, is now the sufficient and the reasonable. How can we decide what we find good enough? And we will see quite a few images to give us some feeling about it, because that seems a simple question. However, that is not so reasonable to figure it out, because, as I said before, you can interpret a very single reading already. So a dozen or two readings allows you to interpret rather a lot if you have lots of a priori knowledge of what you're looking at. If you're looking at an arbitrary image of your arm and you want to make sure that it's not your sister, then it's a completely different story. Then you need much, many more bits, and so you need more components. And the number of components, therefore, is sort of defined by the sort of questions you want to ask from the final result of the data. And the better you can specify that, the better you can also specify what would be your minimum requirements in observations. That's important because these observations tend to be expensive. So it's good to figure these things out. So let's go a bit further and we will now uh, leave our very stylistic uh, 
interferometer where we had two en single elements sitting there. We are now going to make that telescope so can, they can actually track the source. That's handier because then I have enough sensitivity all the time. I will make sure that uh, we fix this thing to the Earth that makes it a bit troublesome because now it's moving all of the, over the place and I must take account of that. We must make sure that we can average over some finite time. We do not instantaneously read because then there is no power. And we must also, and that is very important and very handy, but it is a, it's also a very big issue in terms of setting up the demands that you put on your equipment, the tolerances. We can, with, by means of local oscillators, we can modify the frequency and handle the frequency that we like much better to be handled. And by the way, if we go once more back, this is very important, so I'll do that. To this complex correlator, this thing here is now a piece of cable of some length of a quarter lambda. And if I have a rather large mix of quarter lambda, of lambda, then a quarter lambda is not defined by that cable because for some lambda it's only 80 degrees and for some other lambda it's 100 degrees of phase. If I have sufficiently broad lambda. However, if we use the mixing theorem of Fourier transforms by making a mixer which multiplies the signal with a harmonic signal that generates thereby a sum and a difference signal, then that difference signal is the one that you can then use and have as a much lower frequency. The phase of the difference signal is the original one plus the one at which I bring in this quote local oscillator, this harmonic signal. So, in fact, what I'm doing is I'm referencing the incoming radiation to the phase of the local oscillator. If I do something wrong with the local oscillator, the phase of my signal seems to be moving too. That is a nuisance, but it's also a help, because I can, for instance, put pi over 2 in there at all band, uh, wavelength at the same time. By putting pi over 2 in the local oscillator. That is defined on a single wavelength, and then it's perfectly precisely defined. So, the local oscillator is not only a handy tool for frequency conversion, it is also my reference system. So, distributing the local oscillator to that telescope, and that telescope, and that telescope, and that telescope, before it comes down in the much lower so-called intermediate frequency, is a very demanding system, because I'm bringing the reference around. It is precise as the whereabouts of the telescope. So it is we taken lightly to make a distribution system from one oscillator here to go to that telescope and to that telescope and that telescope to have something precise in those cables. Cables, for instance, electrically get longer or shorter due to temperature. You use very often a coax cable and very Low loss coax cables are filled with gas, and of course very dry gas, so you can put in nitrogen with a little bit of overpressure. If that overpressure leaks, the gas leaks, and the cable length changes. So the phase at the other end changes. It's the same thing as a telescope shaking. So there's lots of sources that can mess up my phases in the proper reference frame. And as they locate these wiggles, in the picture that I'm going to stick together from all these wiggles, I can mess it up quite badly if I don't have the phases right. Uh, so that is in fact jumping ahead from this discussion of the local oscillators. We obviously need a coordinate system to define in what we mean by a phase. If I'm setting up a ripple in the sky with a period of two arc seconds, which is equivalent to uh, 10 microradian, that is very narrow, 10 to the minus 5, 
of angle of radian. That also requires my geometry of the baseline to be defined to 10 to the minus 5, otherwise I don't know where that ripple is. And how can I then possibly co add that with the ripple of another observation tomorrow or yesterday or half an hour later, so as to make the proper picture? So I must have a proper reference frame within which I have calibrated phases in some way or another. So we'll go to the reference frame too. Let's first look at this bandwidth issue. We had a interferometer which has omnidirectional antennae and then you bring the cables here and then we correlate. That's all the, that we had. Now if the source goes way off from the meridional plane of, the, of this baseline, then the path length via one is much longer than that via the other. It's coming in here much earlier than it's coming in at the other one. So I'm correlating the signal with a delay in there. If the bandwidth of the signal is too large, let's say I have a bandwidth of 10%, but I have a delay of 100 lambda, then on this 100 lambda, now, as there are waves out of my passband that do not 100, but 102 lambda. There are other ones that do only 98 lambda, and something in between is there all. So in the end, I do not get the correlation back that I wanted. I get much less, because these are not related anymore. I must have all these elementary frequencies in the passband hold their wavelength and their phase to the point that I start correlating. Otherwise, I'm extinguishing correlation. So the passband does matter. And if I do nothing about it in this reception system to make sure that they get there together again, then I'm getting trouble from the extra wavelength that this signal must have traveled. So if this is what we have, a block function response that's still rather atypical. The reality, of course, is not a block function. It's a, some sort of passband which is smooth. But let's just think you have a passband which goes from new, uh, from a ha minus a half new naught, uh, from new naught minus a half delta new to new naught plus a half delta new. Then Within that passband, we have a function that's in fact the way we selected it. We have a function these, that selected these waves, which has a gain and contribute phase again. All these things are complex. I have a filter machine in there. In comes the cable on one end, on the other end comes out the signal only between these frequencies. The rest is gone. But that amplification is the amplification with a factor G of new gain of new, which is not a regular 17 or 23, but it is a complex number, it has a phase too. It affects the phase, and it most likely affects, affects the phase not completely uniformly across the passband, but it has a structure with, with frequency. So in principle, this gene of new is a complex machine. And this is the precise calculation of what would happen, but you can imagine it right away, actually. We've had that discussion before. We know that the uh, autocorrelation function of the signal that Fourier transforms into the power, uh, uh, power spectrum. Putting it differently, I can make a spectrum of a signal by measuring the autocorrelation at different spacings. And then Fourier transforming it, I get back spectrum. In fact, that is, you can demonstrate that, is even what an optical spectrogram does. Even with, in the beam, the classical way of having a prism of glass. Because the route that the light takes now becomes dependent on the wavelength because it gets more or less deflected, and later on with a lot of piece of optics, I bring them together again. Therefore, it lands at a different location. And what happens is you make a 
uh, wavelength dependent delay within the beam yourself. So you're comparing wa waves from one wavelength from one time with waves of some other time delayed and you check how far the waves are running out of phase. That's basically the only way in which you can verify wavelength. You can verify wavelength only by comparing a wave with another wave that started there similarly and is here now out of phase to some extent. That's the way you do it. So salting wavelength always implies looking at a long stretch of that putting it differently. Did that cure it? Yes, super. So, I keep iterating this point. The wavelength is defined by, by being able to compare signal from some time ago with the signal of right now. With a bunch of waves in there, if they are all still in phase, then the, pass, then the signal has a very narrow band pass. If they are now, after 10 waves, significantly apart from one another in phase, then obviously there's a lot of different frequencies in there. And of course, because of that Fourier transform relationship, we can see straight away that a block function G comes out as a sync function in the spectral domain. We've had that before, so we've discussed the block function sufficiently, that's what you expect, and indeed, that's what you find. That's just because we put in the block function to begin with. So we have assumed g equals unity over the delta nu, and therefore we get this sync function. Showing it even more clearly, if I look at fringes still in the model interferometer that we had. I have two elements here sitting fixed to the earth and this thing is rotating and so the source is walking out of the meridional plane. And at some time the delay of one versus the other gets to be bigger and bigger and bigger, so much bigger that we lose correlation. In fact we can even go through zero and get anti-correlation on the other end. But that all comes from the sync function that we were looking at before. So the source is running along the sky and therefore generating more and more differential delay between the two elements. And that is what's causing this. That is not the way we are going to do it in the end, of course, because we are putting telescopes in there and they are pointing at the source very carefully and if I have a long baseline, this accident will happen not very far away, but it will happen very close by the central plane already, because it happens as soon as I do 10 lambda or something like that in delay. So the trick will be, you'll, you can see it coming already, is that by adding a cable in there, I send the one that comes in first, send it on a detour to come back home and be at the correlator exactly at the other time that the late one, the late arriver is there as well. Then that correlation will make sense and will obviously give the maximum response with minimum delay. That's what we're going to head for. So 
in our earlier idea we had just a fixed baseline and we saw the source walk past. We saw the fringes decay because it ran too far off and therefore there was too much delay between the one and the other. And what do we do about it? Well, obviously, uh, you then can only do something by putting some additional time delay in one line. That helps enormously, that works like this. Uh, the actual source that we are looking at is looking is sitting in the S direction. That's what I didn't know yet because I'm observing, I'm going to find that out. So I have a reference direction for which I think I'm looking at, which is S0, and for S0 I insert a delay, and then there will be a difference delay later on, which is the delay between the source direction and the delay that I have inserted. Now that reference delay, or that difference delay, that will now enter in our phase, of course. That is exactly what we wanted. We have basically now shifted our interferometer from one that is an interferometer like this, that is looking like that, to an interferometer that looks like that. That's the only thing we've done. And now the baseline length is this one. It's the projected baseline. That's what it was also at this time, but we might not have realized that. But now it's completely clear what we've done. By inserting that delay, we have basically made this interferometer that interferometer. And now we are basically completely loose from this trouble of having too much delay in there. There is a slight troublemaker remaining, and we'll come and see that soon. Uh, well, let's try and think of it right now already, before we look at the other thing. Um, I didn't mean that. I mean this. The total set of viewing directions, I correct for a notional viewing direction, that's this ball zero. The total set of viewing directions is defined by my telescopes. If I have receiving elements sitting there at different telescopes that are tracking the sky, these telescopes have a field of view of their own. In fact, it's not much field of view, it's the only beam they have. I have a dipole at the focus, and that dipole looks at an area which is lambda over d big. And that is the field of view. And within that field of view, by having the other telescope sit very far away, I have a ripple sensitivity pattern. try and do it this way. Uh, so, within that field of view defined by the... Oh, I hit, I hit it. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Right. Sorry about that. So, what I'm saying is that this ripple is one lambda per, per line, basically. That's the way it works. That's the whole mechanism of interferometry. You have this ripple pattern, and so the ripple pattern on the sky is defined as one ripple every delta uh, difference there of one, one wavelength at the endpoints of an interferometer. So, if within that field of view there, I'm looking at very many ripples, which will happen when the telescopes are far apart. The telescope looks at lambda over d. So if I have a telescope of 20 meters, 
and I have the other telescope 200 meters away, then at, at best I can see 10 ripples in there. Between here and then, and I look at the edge of what this telescope is looking at. If I put the other one not 200 but 2,000 meters away, that's 100 ripples in there. That means that's 50 lambda between the middle of that viewing direction and the edge of that field of that one telescope. If I have a passband of 20%, you can be assured that the ones at the edge have hardly any sensitivity left. So I must, if I want to look at these 20 lambda either way, then I must make sure that I can see that all, and therefore I must look at a sufficiently narrow passband. So this passband issue is really a serious issue, and the delay setting is a serious issue for this by the same token. Now let's look at the cause for all this trouble. We're having these two telescopes sit there and they're tracking the source, and basically we are looking at a different, if we drive this delay line, we are looking at a different interferometer all the time until we're f losing the stop source at the other end. And with that, do in doing so, I must then therefore insert a delay which must be sufficiently precisely done so that the accuracy of the delay setting is well within the inverse of the bandwidth. Otherwise it doesn't work. I must stay within so many lambda with that delay from the other one in order to correlate properly. And otherwise we have a serious bandwidth loss. And so we have no other way of doing that than by keeping, while we're tracking, keeping this delay being adjusted all the time. Now, fortunately, all the telescopes nowadays do not have all sorts of nice tricks of adding from an analog device more and more cable or so like that. We all control this, this by computers. And calculating how much I need is, of course, trivial now. That's just calculating the developing geometry of the whole thing while the day progresses why the Earth rotates. That's all there is to it. So that part we can easily do. And what we do is we will therefore calculate what the fringe would have been if that source would have been running there. And we take off as many fringes as we need in order to have these things sitting there sufficiently alike. And we can sort of track that way the whole signal. There's another point that is relevant here, but that's a fri fringe benefit. The fact that these fringes are basically rotating while the source is lo looking across the sky is a nuisance for us, because my correlator, therefore, it is one signal, a signal, and uh, one, one channel it sees this signal, and the, the other signal it sees the one in base quality all the time. And if the baseline gets long, that happens very fast. That can go all the way up to 100 hertz or so. But in order to read it properly, I must read it then before it has changed very much. So I must read that at least some five, four or five times per wavelength, and in fact more than that. And thus, you would have to read it very often it doesn't tell you anything. It tells you something after it has gone quite some time. But the fact that it fringes, we understand, we know exactly how that comes about. And there's no new information whatsoever. So I would much rather like something else to organize that that fringe gets counteracted and the fringe doesn't rotate. Now, if I insert the delay precisely right at signal frequency, for the source in question, then the source stays put without any phase change because that phase change is contracted by the delay being switched in. Now if I do it a bit wrong because I didn't know where the source was, then I see only the differential location of the 
source with respect that to that location on the sky as a slightly moving fringe that rotates a little bit until it gets past it and so on. So the, the, what I really want to see is the fringes with respect to some reference position on the sky. That way I do not have to look at all these very awfully fast fringes all the time very with high time resolution but I can just look only at the fringes that are within the field and that tell me how within the field the, the radiation is distributed. And the fact that I make fast fringes by the fact because the earth rotates sure, that's something I can calculate hmm? that I don't need to observe that's a waste of time and effort. So, um, um, so I'm sorry. So uh, you're saying that we're we're tracking the delay in order to, like, in order to to track how this fringe pattern changes due to rotation of the Earth. Not how it changes. That part I cannot track. I can track the very fact that this one position on the sky. Suppose there would be a source on there, that would give me fringes that I can know and exp and understand. Those fringes I don't like to observe. I only want to observe the amplitude and the phase with respect to that point. If the source is not sitting there, but sit, sits next to it, then the phase of that source, suppose it sits half a fringe away, is pi, 180 degrees, and that phase will change because while I'm tracking that source by baseline, Look here, my baseline is almost north-south when the source rises. And then it goes up there, then it becomes east-west, if the baseline is east-west. And then when I get very close to the horizon again, then it's almost north-south. So the baseline, the projected baseline, rotates. And so at some point, I will come to the position that this source, which does not sit at the reference position, but sits to the side, it sits actually almost on top of the fringe anyway because the fringe is long in one direction and not in the other. So I, I'm looking at the differential fringes with respect to this one position of the field, because then I can relocate everything with respect to that one position. And I have already hinted at that position not necessarily being a source. I've, in fact, what you're doing, of course, trying to track the fringes by stop, so stopping them because that gives so much gain in data volume that we need to extract. But the way we do that, of course, is we calculate the fringes as they originate in the fact that the sky comes by while the Earth rotates. Now that is a calculation that is not very hard to do, so any one of you can spend within, get a computer program running within a week that does that for you, precisely. I can tell you that such and such a position on the sky has a phase of such and so much for a baseline that's defined in this coordinate system and the source is sitting at that, that location in the sky and so on. Those are the steering parameters and with that package of steering parameters you can calculate the phase of that fringe, of that source at all times. I can tell you all sorts of things that you forget to think about. And we did, of course, too, before that. Usually atmosphere and that sort of troublemakers. Uh, but in principle, this is a straightforward requirement. That requirement is so straightforward that we actually execute it completely and we do it on the sky. So there is a position on sky that we track precisely and that is what we call the fringe stopping center. And that is now, later on, the reference with, it which, with, with respect to which we are observing the Fourier component. And we have learned already very often that for Fourier transformations, the location of the origin matters. It's exactly the same problem where it matters here. That's why phases are not just nice numbers. Though they tell you something about how far away from here. And if the here is not defined, because I do something wrong about that, then the rest will not work either. So I must make sure that I do my reference framing properly, so 
The sprint tracking is a serious business. It must be done precisely. And you can make all the flaws that mess it up that you can think of. Yet, at the same time, it brings the data rate very far down. And it makes sure that, in the meantime, I have the delay envelope, the coherence envelope that is, in fact, that's just the same thing as the coherence that we have been talking about already before. That coherence envelope is maintained at the middle of my field. That's exactly why I want to have it, of course. So this fringe tracking is a business that that is more complex than you might think. And it's good to realize that it is not a particularly sensible way of doing that, but in certain cable and cable and cable by tiny fractions, like a millimeter or so a piece, you do that completely differently. We'll come to that after we have converted the signal to a lower frequency. There is another problem. We can track very nicely our fringes for this one object in the center. But if there is another source, not at the center, but at the edge, just in the direction of the fringes, and this fringe pattern is rotating, as we already understood before. So this one is still fringing. It's still going up and down and up and down along the edge of the field, because the field is rotating. I must be sure that I take my reading before the averaging starts losing that signal. So I can calculate that. It is calculatable. Again, it's basically rather straightforward. But it's that differential fringe rate that I want to observe. And I therefore must make a budget beforehand that the fringe rate, the differential fringe rate, will be no more than once every 10 seconds or once every 30 seconds. And that specifies how often I must take my readings. Again, that then has to do with the Nyquist sampling law that we have discussed as well, that states I must take my readings sufficiently often and I get all the information. And the sufficiently often def is defined by the frequency content. And we can do our budget here for this problem completely. And that all fits with the concept of what your coordinate system is doing to what you're precisely doing there on the sky. OK. So I don't want this time averaging loss either. So basically, this is the sort of picture of what we're doing. Our single telescope puts a beam on the sky. It is not quite just a disk-like beam. Uniform sensitivity up till here, then bang, gone. Right country, it is a very, it's a very white clock that decays to nothing. It's like an airy pattern, as you all well know. Uh, and we'll possibly come to that as well. But it's good to realize that you're basically confined in viewing direction on the sky by these single elements. And within that area defined by the single elements, there are sources. And those sources, with respect to the fringe stopping center, just make a differential fringe. Suppose I didn't invent the fringe stopping center yet. That's the position that we're talking about right here. We hadn't thought of that yet, but we have this problem of differential fringes. We can also think of that problem completely if we think of pointing at the celestial pole. Then I don't need to drive any delays, because the delays don't change, except for the source insofar as it sits at another position than at the pole itself, because then it goes around the pole, so it goes from minus delay to plus delay, minus right? delay to plus delay in 24 hours. And that gives differential uh, fringes, which give time sparing, and therefore, if I'm not careful, I lose it if I integrate the law. Now that thing at the North Pole is only the most straightforward thing that you can think of, but of course, it doesn't change, not fundamentally, if that thing sits not at North Pole, but sits at some declination. But I have then made sure 
that this central position does not make any fringes because I take them all out. The question still is, and we'll come to that, how you do that precisely, but basically the trick is you put in at signal frequency, you put in as many wavelengths the other way as, this, as the sky is doing for you. Please tell me if I'm not clear, because that this is something that you must be able to follow very precisely, because it defines the reference frame within which we are talking later on. And so that's why it's good to think of that, perhaps first on the celestial pole, because then you don't have this trouble of all the hardware that must be creative about where I put how much delay and what. On the pole, the only thing that generates differential fringes with respect to the celestial pole is the distance between the pole and the location of the source because that source is going around on a fringe pattern. And that fringe pattern we made ourselves on purpose in order to observe the whereabouts of the source better. You can even calculate that precisely. Uh, that is the angular rate of the Earth. So you can calculate the time it takes for fringes. Um, yeah. He was asking that if, if you're in another geographical location, say if you're at the equator, what other uh, point of reference could you use since at the equator both poles, both celestial poles are the useless? You're perfectly right. That it, it is completely dependent. That's what we're telling you saying all the time, depending on your whereabouts of, on Earth, the equator is a terribly bad choice. Because if I have a interferometer sitting uh, in an east-west direction, and we'll come to that why that is nice to do, then we have only resolution in the east-west direction there. Because the projected baseline never has a or south component. Whereas if I live like we do in Holland, as far north as 52 degrees, that's much further away than you guys live from the, from the equator, then our projected baselines in the north-south direction are pretty good. And so if at the equator you want to also look at baselines that must have a north-south component, otherwise I could not put the fringes in any position on the sky, then you have no other solution than to make baselines that do go north-south. You'll have to put a telescope south of the other one. And then you're doing part of this trouble completely in the computer. It does not change because what I'm doing with having these two elements sit there is I'm making a the fringe pattern on the sky, and the source is walking through. If I have a pure north-south baseline, and the source is walking through, here from Colombia, for instance, then that source is walking along the fringes, so it doesn't fringe. So I must maintain a very stable calibration, because otherwise what I see in fringes is just because my one cable is getting longer than the other, and therefore the fringe is moving. The fringe sensitivity pattern, not as what the source is writing, but you can see also that th those fringes as the sensitivity pattern that I'm generating myself. That pattern might be moving if my cables are not stable or if I have other sources that make that fringe pattern move because of my equipment. And then if I'm looking at the source, the source seems to be moving. But it is different for each location on Earth. There you're perfectly right, and that's why it's good to start off thinking of what happens at the pole, and then let's think about it if I go a few degrees away from the pole, so that the projection of the baseline stays completely equally long. I don't have the problem of 
cost of epsilon because cost of, of epsilon is unity anyway, so I don't get for shortening in the story. So, so the geometry stays completely clear, and yet I must point the telescopes, and the point telescopes are doing that, and in doing that, I'm sure, surely going to change how the fringes move a bit, because I get projected baselines in there and so on. But it is only geometry. And so the calculation in the computer that makes the model of what a source will look like that sits this far away from a position on the sky, which I make come out DC, direct current, as a, as a fixed system instead of as a wiggly pattern. I do that in the computer. What that other source do, does with respect to this position is just software. Well, software nature doesn't do it, it's just nature, but we can follow it completely by playing the game properly and making that model. We can sit down and make that model. I'm not sure that that's very much more instructive than making sure in your head, and everybody has his own way of doing that, that this is indeed so what I'm telling you. It's important because then you would know how to get yourself unstuck if you needed that number. And that's the thing that I want you to do. And you can learn that by trying to do it once. That helps a lot. Yet it's not the most interesting part. As long as you're convinced that I'm right, because you would have said the same thing if you thought of it, then that is what I want you to know. Because then, if you want to get going on a thing like that, then I'm sure you learn it very quickly. That's not the difficult part. But the perception is the part that you must acquire. I hope. <laughs> That's what I'm trying. Right, now we're going to talk about how we do this. The real radio signal at signal frequency is a nuisance thing because it doesn't carry very well in cables. And that's very lossy, so I must have very powerful amplifiers. And these amplifiers do all sorts of bad things, like a complex gain function that goes in there. Therefore, that must be stable, because I want the phase to be stable, because it's my reference phase, and so on. So it is a very demanding thing. It's handy, and yet at the same time demanding. What we're doing is we're uh, with a heterodyne system, we are using the modulation theorem out of the Fourier transform and say that if I have an arbitrary function, which is the signal coming in, and I multiply that with the cosine cosinusoid of a known frequency, then out comes the sum of the two frequencies and the difference of the two frequencies. And the difference of the two frequencies, therefore, can be made something very nice and practical. In Westerbork, we built it such that we had 1415 megahertz come down from the top end of the telescope in a cable at 30 megahertz. So we were mixing with a frequency of 1385 megahertz, but then a, just a, a continuous wave signal. So we had an oscillator in the central building, which we distributed out to the telescopes. In fact, those cables are so lossy that, again, at 1385, distributing it requires too much power. So what you do is, you're sending it out at a ninth of that, and a 60 and some, something megahertz, no, and a 50, I think it was a bit. And then, you hit it with an A-linear amplifier at the other end very badly, you take the ninth harmonic. You can do that, and then amplify the ninth harmonic and use that as the local oscillator. That requires all your electronics to be rather stable, otherwise my phase is not defined. But the phase is still, in principle, nicely defined also for the ninth harmonic, if I carry this signal out to the telescope. So this Local oscillator distribution is a, is a significant issue. But then you bring it out and it comes home at 30 megahertz. That means I have about 10 meter wavelength on the inter intermediate frequency that comes home. And with the bandwidth that we were looking at, 
of the order of 4 megahertz, the delay envelope, the coherence length, was about 80, 70 to 80 meters. So a single 10 meter step, or something approximated to the best 10 meter, to be in the middle of your coherence envelope is good enough. And as it is one wavelength at the intermediate frequency, I could step in, bang one wavelength, or bang two wavelengths, or bang three wavelengths, and not change the phase of the local velocity. Not a change of the uh, outgoing signal either. So what you do is we, you shift in cables of that length, if not one lambda, but it's half a lambda or two thirds of a lambda, then it must make the phase correction at the same time. So I must have some device somewhere else that affects the phase. Then I change that, I do it in steps. And if I don't do, then don't do a thing anymore, then the fringe would still remain running. But I know how that fringe is running, and therefore, that last bit I take out with a device like the pi over 2 in the, cross, in the correlator there. But in the lo local mixer, just prior to the correlator, I have a phase shifter in there that does just that, under computer control. And therefore, I can stop the fringes in the field center. And so what you do is you come from uh, the radio signal frequency which you don't like to carry home. And so you use the down conversion and you then make an intermediate frequency which we call IF. And that one you bring home, but we will now see what else we have now caused on the pulse. I come in at, uh, with an LO, and that is the sensor frequency that together gets mixed, and I get an intermediate frequency that comes out of that. That filter chooses now precisely which band I like. I don't do that up here at the filter frequency, uh, signal frequency, because uh, that's much too high a frequency. This is much easier electronics. And in any case, I want to get the other one out, the sum frequency, because the sum frequency is very high. It's about twice as high as what I and what I have here or what I have in the local oscillator. And I want to get rid and get only the one out. So the, what we do here is we clip everything here off and we end up with only a low frequency. And in that signal that you have there, you still have the amplitude and signal and the amplitude and phase of the original signal. Phase now reference to the local oscillator signal. So, in this local oscillator signal, I have a phase rotator, and that I use on one of the two arms, together with the delay shifting, before I correlate here. And I do this by making sure that I now get out something that is referenced to the proper phase of the signal and the phase of the local oscillator. And so, out comes the correlation coefficient that I liked, plus the phase that is caused by the delay errors that I have made, plus the local oscillator phase, sorry, here, and it comes at a frequency which is only the intermediate frequency. But the phase information is, is still there, but it's good to realize that the phase of the local oscillator is in there as well. And that phase of the local oscillator obviously is a non-trivial thing to bring all the way up to the first mixer. And that's what you want to do, because that's where the reference effect, effect comes from there on. It is more difficult to make the phase bad because the wavelength is much longer. So it's easier to maintain the proper phase. But at signal frequency, it is tricky. Therefore, I go with the first mixer close to the telescope. 
and I must distribute the local oscillator to do that properly and have the phase of that signal there mean something with respect to the phase that I've brought out here. And that is the hard part of the story. You can see it, uh, uh, sorry, you can see it sitting in, in there quite clearly. So the final result that I'm getting has the local oscillator phases in there. And at the same time, under computer control, I have this phase rotator, which I do, of course, on the local oscillator, because that is the easy way of carrying the phase around without doing that separately for each wavelength, which is what you didn't want. You want the phase, for instance, to make a sine correlator out of a cos correlator, so to do the quadrature correlation, you need all the phases at all wavelengths to be shifted bang by 90 degrees. And not that the shorter wavelength go 100 degrees and the longer wavelength go only 80 degrees. So that's the nice way of doing it in the local oscillator. So now, this whole story makes it relatively easier and we are now in charge of the runoff phase while we are doing it because we can make the phase run as we like and nature makes the phase run somewhat differently as it likes and the difference is exactly what I want to observe because that tells me how the sources look. So what I do is I do the calculation of what I like so that the difference between what I like and the sky is minimized because that is the easiest way of measuring and then I have only a somewhat different problem left over. I have now three directions that I'm looking at. Each of them def differently defined. One is defined by this single dish that's saying I'm going to look there. If I don't point properly or the beam is not so well then of course I get troubles and I don't get that much troubles on axis but the source that's sitting to the side of the primary beam is sitting at a very steep slope of the primary beam and I miss point slightly and I get errors in there that look as if the source is variable in intensity and that is hurting like hell in the picture that I'm going to make so the center of pointing of that telescope does matter for the success that I'm going to have that's one. The other one is, I want to be sure that the total delay of everything that's in there makes it so that I'm sitting in the center of the field at the correlation center. The center of the correlation envelope, the coherence envelope. That's what I'm driving the delay for in order to achieve that. Now that is sometimes sitting a bit off. I don't want to, it to go that far off. And so I have a worry there as well. And then the last one, and that is the one that is the most fundamental reference, that's that phase stopping, fringe stopping center, the phase reference center. And that's what I'm maintaining completely with all the electronics. And all these, of course, we think they're the same, but they're completely physically differently defined. So they're not the same at all. In fact, this. Uh, the lay envelope, the center of the coherency, is walking meters back and forth all the time. But as long as it works, walks back and forth only a small fraction of the size of the coherence envelope, it does not affect the sensitivity significantly. And that's what I want to make sure of. I want to make be sufficiently close to that. So, now that we have, I think this is exactly where we should switch over to the next hour. Now that we have defined how we do these things, we can have now sort of brought back where our references are. And now we must express that in a proper reference frame, of course. So we must now do the full discussion properly of this geometry. But at least now you have seen where it matters, because in the end, I cannot do anything with Fourier, Fourier components if they don't mean something. And that must be in a reference frame. So a phase that I read is a phase with respect to something else. As we saw before, we look at a ripple on the sky, and that ripple on the sky 
I'm sure it's awfully difficult to maintain at the proper position. But if I maintain it at some position, then with respect to that position I can make the proper picture. If I can the phases with that respect to that position. So that is what we must make sure that we can keep ourselves on top of at least that part of the story. Then it will work. And it will not work on the model of having a reference point here and a reference point there and then observe the fringes because the fringes will be only there very shortly and even this is not properly maintained and the sensitivity of one and the other end is not and so on. So there's much to watch that we must improve there but it adds complexity. This is a good point to wait for half an hour and I will, I hope you can recuperate from all this thing in this half hour and then we will take off again in at four o'clock. <laughs>